I'm Grant Oliphant, and this is We Can Be. As we were recording episodes for the season three launch of We Can Be, the coronavirus drastically altered the world, and we held on to those earlier recorded episodes as we pivoted to bring you a special series focused on COVID-19. Now, as we share those earlier recorded episodes of season three, the work of those guests has taken on even greater significance, and this week's guest is no exception. David Hickton recently took on the duties of staff director of the House Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Crisis. He will help ensure the trillions of dollars the U.S. government has earmarked for COVID-19 relief are spent wisely and effectively. If there's a man who can do that, it's David Hickton. David Hickton is a name that may sound familiar and for good reason. For the past several decades, he has been a key figure in a multitude of groundbreaking cases that have gained international headlines for their against the odds triumph of justice. He is the founding director of the University of Pittsburgh's Institute for Cyber Law, Policy and Security, who has recently been in the news for his work focusing on how biases and municipal algorithms can perpetuate inequity in our communities and cities. But his influence has reached far beyond those recent headlines. As a United States attorney appointed by President Obama, he brought indictments against members of the Chinese Liberation Army for hacking and stealing trade secrets from major corporations. David has also brought cases involving unconstitutional confinement conditions for those with serious illness, spoken up for victims of sexual assault, gone after for-profit higher education entities that were scamming students, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. We start this episode with Dave reading from the speech that he shared with the World Affairs Council in Pittsburgh in January of 2020, called Immigration 2.0. My family is a product of our immigration heritage. Our family's history is common and, of course, unique. My late father was born John Joseph McNulty in an orphanage to a desperate single mom who had just come here from Ireland to connect with his father. Family lore has it that my grandfather was killed in a workplace accident before she arrived. Dad was born in a church environment and was adopted by George and Martha Hickton, who lived in the rectory next to the convent. They were so poor that they earned their keep by doing carpentry and odd jobs, and she served as the seamstress for the priest's vestments. Dad had an exceptional sense of humor and risking blasphemy, often joked that only in America could a child like him have its start that merged the stories of Jesus Christ and George Washington. My late mother was a McDermott from Ireland on her father's side and a Callison from Denmark on her mother's side. The McDermott's sold whiskey. The Callisons worked as blacksmiths on the railroads, drove taxis and limousines, and were for a time undertakers. Both sides of the family loved baseball, boxing, and had a weakness for horse racing. They all came here because they wanted a better life and opportunity, and they were hungry and eager to succeed and contribute. Our extended family today is a mix of English, French, Danish, German, Russian, Ukrainian, Polish, Mexican, and Colombian descent. We are a proud family of immigrants in a nation of immigrants. We cherish our American citizenship and cherish all of the cultural traditions of each component of the mix. Our drive to succeed comes from our immigrant past and our desire to prove our worth backwards and forwards. Everything we have is because of the opportunity we found in America, and an important component of that success is that two generations later, the traditions from the countries of our origin survive. Dave Hickton, thanks so much for being here. Sure, thank you, Grant. Yeah. What I'm about to say will not surprise you at all, but I view you as somebody with an incredible passion for justice. And given that you were U.S. attorney for this region, um, that seems kind of obvious. But your version of that and what makes me remark on it is, I think, a commitment to fairness across all spheres that you work with. And I'm curious how a boy from the Midwest grows up to have the type of thirst for justice that you do. 
Wow, it's a great question. It comes from so many different directions. If you go back to when I was a young boy, it really came from a really close relationship with my grandmother. I remember very vividly her telling me stories and and giving me the book Profiles in Courage by John F. Kennedy when oh, I was a young boy. Oh, wow. It was one of the first books I read. How old were you, would you say? Maybe seven. The essence of the book was that public service was not something you did for the entire period of your life and that the opportunity for public service was such that you should never miss the opportunity part of it and you should also never miss the responsibility part of it. And responsibility in the lure of that book was that people sacrificed their perch in public service in the interest of doing the right thing. My father was adopted. He grew up as basically the only white child in a largely African-American neighborhood. We were raised to believe color did not matter any more than the color of your hair. We were just taught to believe that we're all born the same. We may look different. We may come from different places. And that the uh, most fundamental final exclamation point was when I went to school was the first time I said the Pledge of Allegiance and how loudly we said the end in freedom and justice for all. So I've tried to live that my entire life. I believe that a civil rights insult, uh, a, an unfairness, act of unfairness to one of us is, a, is an insult to all of us. So clearly you've had this since you were a kid. And I, I love the idea that you were given profiles and courage to read at the age of seven. Yeah. <laughs> I think that wouldn't be typical reading for for most kids that age. Uh, yeah, my and, grandmother gave us new pajamas and a book every Christmas. Yeah. And, a, and a serious book, <laughs> yeah. uh, but an inspiring one. You made a decision to go from private practice, where you had a lucrative practice and were, were quite successful, into public service when President Obama nominated you to become a U.S. attorney. Aside from a generic impulse around public service, what drew you to doing that role specifically? Well, uh, it was just always an itch I had to scratch. Because my dad had been in public service, he had served as the local district attorney in an extraordinary circumstance by judicial appointment after the death of his predecessor. He had left his private practice in much the way I did, at the peak of his practice, mm -hmm. in the middle of his career to serve. That had a factor. But because of him, when I came back to Pittsburgh, there was a large interest in whether I was going to pursue a public service career. And I sort of felt that I could do a better job if I established myself first and became financially independent, if you will. Mm -hmm. I had borrowed a lot of money to go to college and law school. And I thought that if I had some achievements in the practice of law, I could go into public service a little bit later in my career. It's a, it's a hard life. It's it a is. great sacrifice to be in public service. You have been associated with a laundry list of hot-button social issues in the time that you were a U.S. attorney, and even since, and what you've spoken out about and continued to express concern about cybersecurity, child and inmate safety, the battle against opioid abuse, equity and algorithms. It was an interesting development to have a U.S. attorney in southwestern Pennsylvania become the nation's leading expert on cybersecurity threats from a Justice Department perspective. What was it that made you realize, boy, this is a big issue and we ought to focus on it here? When I did my inventory of what the threats were in the district and I went around and talked to community stakeholders, I was struck that both the corporate community and the labor community were very concerned that particularly as China had entered the World Trade Organization in 2001, by about 2004, 2005, a threat vector emanating from China, which was affecting our ability to compete in world markets, mm -hmm. was there, evident, and not being attended to. And then I inherited an office that had a lot of assets. We had great university here in Pitt and CMU. We had the CERT computer emergency readiness team and the SCI Software Engineering Institute. We had the National Cyber Forensic Training Alliance to assess threats and it became an indispensable resource to my work. And then 
around the Department of Justice, which has 93 offices, there were 30 who were given sort of CHIPS lawyers, which was computer hacking intellectual property. They were a grant from Washington, Mm. and we had one or two of those lawyers, and a couple of them had been pretty successful in doing some cases. And so when I assessed how I was going to manage the office of the U.S. Attorney and allocate the resources and establish priorities, I felt I had a unique opportunity. And I think the fact that I was outside of the beltway but close enough was another key factor Mm. because I think I could have only done what I did here in Pittsburgh outside of Washington. And so that began a process of taking on some really big cases in the cybersecurity area. Beginning in 2014, I know that you actually went after the Chinese People's Liberation Army for hacking into trade secrets at companies like Westinghouse. Over time, you also brought indictments against Evgeny Bogachev, one of the world's most notorious cyber hackers, and Darkode, the largest English-speaking cybercrime forum, just to name a few. Did you get death threats? Were you ever? Did you ever feel intimidated taking on these sort of global bad guys? I was under the marshals and the FBI's protection three times when I was U.S. attorney, but it had nothing to do with the cyber work. It had to do with other things. And in two of the three cases, it was really just a person who was troubled, who had fixated on me kind of the way Travis Bickle did in the old movie Taxi Driver. But what I did have to do is when I brought those cases that you mentioned, there were steps taken to provide greater cybersecurity for me, Mm -hmm. hardening my system for anticipated attacks. I started in 2010, and obviously these cases took a little while to bring. And after the PLA case, the People's Liberation Army case, if you pulled my name up on Google, three-quarters of the references were in Chinese characters. <laughs> Is I, that right? I wow. captured the attention of there, because right. the, the PLA case was the, they tell me at the DOJ, the the biggest news story the D- DOJ ever did. It was a cover above the fold in every paper in the world. Wow. And, you know, it was the first time the United States had identified the tool of indictment to fight nation-state hacking. And imagine how we did it. We did it out of Pittsburgh against identified members of an army. Imagine if China had done that to us. Spying on Pittsburgh, our city, the target of an international scheme. Today we are announcing an indictment against five officers of the Chinese People's Liberation Army for serious cybersecurity breaches against six American victim companies. A federal grand jury in Pittsburgh has found that these five Chinese military officers conspired together and with others to hack into the computers of organizations in the western Pennsylvania and elsewhere in the United States. So it was a fairly big deal. And when it happened, uh, there was a lot done, probably the means and methods of which I shouldn't describe further, right. but steps were taken to protect me. Russia was interesting because you mentioned Bogachev, who's probably the most notorious cyber criminal in the world. But I also opened many other Russian cases, including the Russians who hacked our election in 2016. Right. When those came, I was a little bit more concerned, candidly, for my personal safety. Right. You know, China is an economic threat to us. But they have eight times our population. They have a largely state-sponsored commercial system that doesn't have the same growth we do, but it has this rich support of the government. Right. But they are really trying to become a partner for us. They're the number two economy. We're number one. And Mm -hmm. I think we have much in common with them. The challenge with China, and the reason I did those cases, is because I thought it was essential to protect our interests that China follow our rules and norms over the Internet and respect innovation, invention, research, development, copyright, patent, and all those things if they were going to participate in our market. And that's what they were not doing. The effects of economic espionage are far-reaching. Obviously, the victim companies lose their capital investments in research and technology. But the important message is that cyber theft impacts real people. When these cyber intrusion occurs, production slows, plants close, workers get laid off and lose their homes. 
Russia was an entirely different challenge. Russia was a rogue state whose goals, it seems to me, are to reconstitute the former glory of the Soviet Union, which they can only do by destroying NATO and destroying democracy. Right. And it's very clear, if you just pay attention to the recent news, that they're giving plutonium in the tea of people they meet with around the world. I mean, they are killing people, assassinating people. So I was a little bit more worried about that. Now that I'm out of government, I'm not on anybody's radar, right. except <laughs> you. <laughs> let's, well, let's not use that line, though. <laughs> uh, what is the value of indictments against foreign nationals who are working for their states against our interests? As you say, I really believe it's important, mm -hmm. and I believe it's tremendously short-sighted to look at those indictments and say that they're fruitless because we can't bring the people here. I believe that, in the first instance, destroying the anonymity of a cyber hacker takes away their power and their currency. In the second instance, by declaring that you know what's going on and you're educating people, you tell a story you're establishing the foundation for what will ultimately occur at some point is some accord around the world about what are the rules internationally. And then it gives comfort to the victims. You can't tell victims of cyber hacking who've invested millions and billions of dollars in research and who are having it stolen from them that there's simply nothing we can do. It's waving the flag of surrender in a way that I just was uncomfortable. Like Mueller's indictment last week, that 24 indictment of the Chinese military hackers was meticulous in its detail, down to specific actions and locational information about individual named Chinese hackers. The architect of that 2014 indictment, cybersecurity expert named David Hickton, he's the guy who started the U.S. government down this path. We have to treat the effort to stop hacking like the effort to go to the moon. President Kennedy said we do this not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And I said that many times as U.S. attorney. Sure, it's going to be more difficult to bring someone from China to Pittsburgh for a trial, but what would we do otherwise? Surrender? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't accept that. What, what frustrated me when I came to the U.S. attorney's office is there were a lot of naysayers who said, well, we don't want to do these cases because all the defaults that occur make it highly unlikely we're going to get to the finish line. We could have not built the case. We could have built the case and could have not got an indictment. We could have got an indictment and Washington could have said, we can't do this, which they could have. Mm -hmm. Or we could bring the indictment and then it could flop because people would say, well, it's, you know, it's, it's of no moment. I believe that Pittsburgh has served an absolutely vital and indispensable role. And if you just look at the China case, one year after we brought that China case, President Xi came to the White House because of our case hmm. and said, we understand the difference now between routine spying and intellectual property theft. And we agree with the United States now hmm. that stealing technology over the Internet is theft, and we will not do it anymore. And from that day forward, President Obama and President Xi in September 2015, because of our case one year earlier, made an agreement that largely held, and all commentators said that hacking of intellectual property theft went down to almost nil until the Trump administration started this trade war, and now the hacking you know, the deal was off. So that's, a, that, that's flipping the usual narrative that most people think of. I think what most people think happened was that that intellectual property theft continued unabated, and that was why the administration took the action that it did. Absolutely know? untrue. I could cite source and source and source. You know, in, an, in a, in a post-truth world, it's very hard to figure out for the rank-and-file citizen what's actually going on around us. What do you say to people who who just don't believe that there was hacking, that Russia wasn't a factor in the 2016 election, that we really don't have to worry about it again? I, I don't really know what to say, to be completely candid, mm. to someone who does not identify the nose on their face as the nose on their face, <laughs> right. as they used to say at St. Anne's School. <laughs> no, right, right. Um, look, there is no question 
And if you don't take it on faith from me because I saw it and I opened the case, just identify it as the Russian signature, and we can show you how many different countries they did the exact same thing. Mm. So it circumstantially looks like Russia. Would you agree that it was not a hoax that the Russians were engaged in trying to uh, impact our election? Absolutely. That was not a hoax. We have underplayed, to a certain extent, that aspect of our investigation that has and would have long-term damage to the United States that we need to move quickly to uh, address. In your investigation, did you think that this was a single attempt by the Russians to get involved in our election, or did you find evidence to suggest they'll try to do this again? No, it wasn't a single attempt. Uh, they're doing it as we sit here, and they expect to do it uh, 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 during the, the next campaign. To a citizen who disbelieves that, I don't know what to say, but if you say hypothetically, would you consider this a threat to the country, and they still don't acknowledge that that's a threat to the country, that's a choice. Right. That's a choice to disregard facts for purposes of getting to a result-oriented conclusion. You know, we, you and I might have a different opinion about the outcome, depending on our point of view, but we used to never dispute the facts. Right. It is not debatable that Russia hacked our election. It ought not be debatable that future hacks would be bad for our country. I don't know what to say to people who struggle with that. Fascinating. I mean, this became such an interest for you that when you left the U.S. Attorney's Office, you went to the University of Pittsburgh and became the founding director of the Institute for Cyber Law Policy and Security. Shortly after that, you launched a Blue Ribbon Commission on Pennsylvania election security, which I had the privilege of serving on. It's been a year since that report came out. The report found that there were vulnerabilities and a need to take action. A year later, how are we doing in Pennsylvania? I think Pennsylvania is leading the way. I feel very good about that work. I'm very grateful for not only your service, but support of that endeavor. I don't think anyone else has done what we've done, which is a nonpartisan, academically based attempt to try and create a model for a state that other states could take. Mm -hmm. And I think it's funny that we're talking today because I'll give you just a little inside baseball. You know, I'm never satisfied. It's never good enough, and it's never fast enough, anything I do. Um, <laughs> right. I challenged my team at Pitt Cyber that surely there is an, a, a digital or cyber solution for elections. If we can put our income tax on digital platform, if we can put our medical records, if we can go to the moon <laughs> on the cyber platform, we can vote on the cyber platform. And you know, we kept coming up with a dry well on that. Nobody supported the idea. Right. And there were examples in Estonia, which was one of the countries that Russia had hacked. There were examples with military service members in West Virginia trying to do it off an app, off a phone. And here we sit, you're talking to me today after the Iowa caucuses, right. which just collapsed because of a defective app. One campaign source says that the results app that they were using, this was a new app that they were supposed to be reporting each result from each precinct uh, location around the state, uh, has not been working. Uh, the guy in the White House is chuckling all night here, showing the Democrats can't even get a three-car funeral organized, or whatever you want to call it. The party's backup telephonic reporting system likewise has failed. I've just been on hold pretty much since 8.30 trying to report these results in. So on my way here to visit with you, I called my team at Pitt Cyber, and I said, I want to call you and thank you for not saying I told you so. <laughs> because the yes. central conclusion of our work was at this moment in 2019, 2020, there is no way to protect voting unless we maintain a paper backup. An issue that this work led you to, combined with, I think, your innate commitment to fairness that you grew up with is to understand other ways in which our computer platforms and technology lead us to unintended consequences. In this case, I'm thinking about computer algorithms and their contribution to inequity. How did that 
even get on your radar? You know, there's a funny story and the and the serious story. The the serious story is we have these two fantastic people. I mean, there's a lot of people in the Department of Human Services here, but Aaron Dalton and Mark Cherna, they're trying to do the right thing. They're doing pioneering things. And they had come up in the child welfare area with a way to do what everybody wants to do, to more rapidly and more efficiently make a better job of prioritizing children at risk. But they also had the presence to realize, look, we're marshalling this data using technology, and what we don't want to do is reinforce inequity. We certainly don't want to, there and in the police and law enforcement area, create a digital Jim Crow Mm -hmm. where we take bad data from over-policing or over-enforcement and conclude that just because it was that way in the past, it's going to be that way, and we want to get there quickly but wrongly. Mm. The funny story is I have a small team at Pitt Cyber, and within that group, I have a f- fantastic executive director, Beth Schwanke, and now Chris DeLuzio is policy director. And Beth came to me with algorithms, and I said, Beth, I still break into cold sweats when I think of college calculus. I don't think I'm the guy to work on algorithms. <laughs> and I said, I also feel that when I get up in the morning, I look in the mirror, I see myself as a civil rights advocate, and I just don't see the connection. And she kept giving me things to read and giving me information. And then I finally got it. We're never going to go backwards on the use of digital applications. But whether you're talking about acute crime analysis or social welfare protections for domestic abuse or children at risk, you know, the numbers are staggering in those areas. And Municipal resources are always going to be finite, so it is incumbent upon all of us to get there faster and more cheaply so we can take care of more people. That's the challenge of government every day. But the best way to understand the metamorphosis on a substantive basis for me is to talk about facial recognition technology. Right. When I was U.S. attorney, and I've always traveled a lot, I was just fascinated by facial recognition technology, and I was all in to be candid for a while until I realized that if you use it wrongly, it's disastrous. Because if you're talking about identifying a white male who's an American, we have a tremendous database, which is the foundation of facial recognition technology, and it's very accurate. If you're talking about identifying minority population, immigrant population, or women, it comes up with spectacularly large numbers of false positives. So much so that a place like San Francisco has enacted a local ordinance banning its use. You know, we're going through a basic three-step process. What does it look like? What are the problems? And what are the solutions? You know, what is it? Why does it matter? And what are we going to do about it? And we're going to be able to come out of this process, and I'm very excited about it, as you can tell, identifying the present horizon, state of play with, with uh, algorithms and digital decision-making, We're going to be able to talk about what the next frontier might be and what we should be concerned about. We're going to talk about where the problems are, and we're going to talk about solutions. And the critical part of it, I really credit your organization with Hmm. having a role in. We know the answer is going to be transparency and telling people that if machines are making decisions that affect their lives, they deserve to know about it. And the way you do that and the way you do the proper work of our task force is you do a lot of community engagement. And your participation in this work has been really stressing the importance of the community engagement Mm -hmm. piece. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to have four community forums and more. People are going to be empowered to tell us what they really think and why they're upset. If you create a barrier between yourself and people who want to tell you what you really need to know, you're never going to get to the right decision. Mm -hmm. The ways in which we use predictive analytics, which is a a fancy term for an algorithm that can identify certain possibilities for us before they happen, the ways in which we use it in this county are fairly extensive and, and as I understand it, ahead of most of the country in looking at the application of predictive analytics to social problems. You mentioned a few areas that we look at, and I think people 
when they hear about this, become concerned about two things. They become concerned about Big Brother, uh, and you mentioned facial recognition as, as an example of this. So one of the concerns about facial recognition is that it will track us everywhere, and uh, every someone in government, in authority, will know our every movement, which feels like an invasion of privacy. But the other thing people become concerned about is who's writing those algorithms and how do we know that those algorithms are in fact unbiased and objective and don't replicate the very same isms that cause divisions in our society. So racism is the most obvious, but gender has played out on any number of fronts. Given that they're built into our DNA, it seems, and built so ingrained so deeply into our society, how can we create algorithms that are free of those concerns? There will be some ways that are easy. For example, this is a new area. There's been a lot written in the last three years, and most of the people who have written it are working with us. If you rely upon the data in cities where there was a Department of Justice consent decree against the police department, you can pretty much assume, since it was a consent decree, Mm -hmm. (laughs) that both the Department of Justice and those underlying police departments recognized that there was over-policing and there was a need for reform. So if you just took the data from those cities, you would probably have a problem. So there will be automatic indicators of data that is suspect. And of course, all of this digital decision-making is what is your database and then how are you applying an algorithm to take that database and make predictive or dispositive decisions. Right, right. The harder challenge is going to be how do you, especially to scale, inventory with accuracy what your database is, your foundation. Now look, I just came back from a trip I was on a plane and a domestic trip, but I took some international trips last year, my photo is being taken almost every time I get on a plane right now. Mm -hmm. Where's that going? Right. I go through as a trusted traveler the airport so I don't have to stand in the passport line and my photo is taken there. Where's that going? We know that in China and and other places that don't have our freedoms, your picture is being taken all the time. Right. But probably your listeners wouldn't appreciate that the average American or average Pittsburgher is photographed 14 times a day. You go to the Mac machine, you're photographed. You go to the gas station, you're photographed. You're available on on the security camera at Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts, depending on what your preference is. <laughs> right. When the Boston Marathon bombing happened, we had an indirect role in that because Pittsburgh resources went up to Boston. And if you remember... The shootout with the two brothers who did that dastardly deed occurred on Friday for an event that happened on Monday. Mm -hmm. And by Thursday morning, their pictures were being circulated around the country. Right. How do you think we got that? Breaking news on NBC 26 Live at 5. The SBI just releasing new information on who might be responsible for the Boston Marathon bombings within the last hour. The special agent in charge revealed pictures you see right here of two men, both taken by surveillance cameras near the explosion site. After a very detailed analysis of photo, video, and other evidence, we are releasing photos of these two suspects. They are identified as suspect one and suspect two. As you can see, the quality of the photos is quite good, but we will continue to work on developing additional images to improve their identification value. The video that was all over Boston allowed us digitally to identify two individuals who were near the finish line, who had backpacks when they arrived and didn't have backpacks when they left. Wow. (laughs) And that was done in 48 hours. Imagine the virtue of that. Right. That's a fantastic advance from what we would have done just 20 years ago. But the consequence for law-abiding citizens is dramatic. And I just don't think the public really understands that this is as much a corporate eavesdropping problem as it is a government eavesdropping problem. This is why Pitt Cyber really exists, because Pat Gallagher said to me when he asked me to come over to Pitt, we've connected 7 billion plus people, and we have no rules, right? no policy. What is the way 
that we can highlight this debate so that an informed public can weigh in. So, again, the algorithm project is virtuous in its own right for the conclusions we will reach, but it is also a platform to teach people right. <laughs> about what's going on in this area. Do you think we as private citizens, as Americans, are too cavalier about protecting our privacy? Or is it appropriate in the scary age that we're living in to say, you know, we need this, we need to be monitored so we can be kept safe? I think it depends. And I think that's one of the challenges, because whether we ever get to norms and laws, which everybody's happy with, it's going to be either an objective standard or a subjective standard. And I don't think we're ever going to get to an objective standard that's universally accepted. The entire Fourth Amendment analysis, which is the search and seizure rule in the United States, spins on reasonable expectation of privacy. All matters, Mm -hmm. large and small, court cases depend upon those words. And the reasonable expectation of privacy has shifted in the digital age. And my opinion, it's different on a generational basis. Mm -hmm. When I was trying to build support for our case against China and for a campaign of applying law to digital space, and I was talking to many audiences, including the people in Washington, back in 2010, 11, and 12, I would give a talk that would go like this. Listen, there is no wall thick enough or high enough that can protect you from a determined nation-state actor in China, Russia, North Korea, or Iran. We will protect you. We're going to make this important. We're going to build the cases, and we're going to demand that they be brought. And I would get standing ovation. Mm. In 2016 or 17, I went down to Museum in D.C., which is the museum that just closed, which is my favorite museum, unfortunately, closed. And the subject that I was on the panel for was, how does the media cover digital? I made the same comment, and the audience, which was largely millennials, booed me. Booed me. And I departed from prepared remarks, and I said, wait a second. I don't need standing ovations. Right. (laughs) (laughs) But that is such a stark contrast. And This has repeated itself over and over and over again. I think the millennials and people like our kids are cavalier about their privacy. Their attitude is they grew up on social media. They share way more than I would share. You know, they think it all evaporates. And they they consider themselves more an open book than a person like me. Their attitude is that if it's on the Internet, you can't have a reasonable expectation of privacy. I don't agree with that. I point out to them when we debated over the dinner table, you can't be a parent of six children like I am and not have an expectation of privacy over the Internet. Your homework comes over the Internet. Your sports schedule came over the Internet. Your teacher evaluations came over the Internet. And when you were doing something wrong, that came over the Internet. Now, I don't think it's right for people to assume that because it was transmitted digitally that that it's it, fair game. it's everybody's business yeah and i think we have this thing in this country that we're not hanging on to and this is the first touchstone for me in all my work pre-digital norms mm-hmm. before we had the internet we had accepted norms in this country how in the world are we going to lead the world and establish norms around the world if we don't even have a consensus in our country mm-hmm. so yes people are becoming cavalier about their privacy what is also true though grant is they're they, for some reason, I think this is a historical healthy suspicion of government, is they really want to take the government to task all the time, but they don't care that Google... We, we've we been talking about this in our family. You know, we, we, we were all watching Tombstone, and we ended up getting unsolicited ads for Western movies with John Wayne. Hmm. That doesn't happen by accident. Right. Somebody's listening. Right. And these people that are bold enough to have Alexa in their home, I don't even understand that, that they have these devices that make your day go easier, but they are clear portals into your privacy. Yeah. And then we have the well, debate. so is the Siri on my phone that I carry everywhere. Absolutely. Siri knows you very well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but then you have this debate that plays out every time we have a terror attack with encryption where the FBI or the DOJ is trying to get into a phone of a dead terrorist, Mm -hmm. and it's encrypted. And Apple fights the opening of that phone, saying, if we encrypt writ large 
we can reduce hacking, but we've never had in our country a place which is inaccessible to a legitimate law enforcement inquiry if there's probable cause, a warrant, and a judge signs off on it. We went through this with trunks of cars. We went through this with safe deposit boxes. Mm -hmm. We went through it with purses. You can't say... I'm sorry, government, this is my private space. Yeah. Now, I think that's where this whole debate's going to hit. I was only in the Department of Justice for six and a half years, so I'm not a career prosecutor. Mm -hmm. I think I have a balanced point of view. I truly believe, and I've told everyone who would listen, if the encryption debate is parked at Pitt Cyber, we could, we could solve it. People of goodwill could solve that debate. Right. And that would, solve, that would have a ripple effect of solving some of these other debates. But we have to come to a consensus about, first, what is our reasonable expectation of privacy? What is it in digital space? Who, what, where, and when can intrude upon our privacy? When does security over privacy matter? And in what context? Lots of questions. Yeah, and profound questions that um, all inevitably become controversial. One of the ways in which you've flirted with controversy over the years, and I think displayed a lot of courage in doing it, is on a completely different front. So let's switch for a moment and talk about the Catholic Church. You, at a certain point, grappled with um, issues of your own past and decided to write about the concerns about abuses in the Catholic Church. And actually wrote a very personal story about why you thought it was important for the Catholic Church to acknowledge what was happening, particularly the diocese in Pittsburgh. And you got, I know, major blowback as a result of that. But you also heard from a lot of folks who are very grateful. I'd just like you to talk with us for a moment about that. Sure. I really am pained by both the existence of the child abuse that has happened in the Catholic Church and, if it's possible, equally pained by the terrible lack of leadership that the Church continues to exhibit mm. in dealing with it. When I was U.S. Attorney, I really had a very strong profile in the area of child protection, child exploitation, and had created a human trafficking group in the office, and it was really kind of in the era area of what was then called child porn, mm. which was misdescription. Child porn is really violence against very young children over the internet using sex as a medium. Just the most horrible crimes you can imagine. And we did a lot of cases there, including the first case involving a child porn conspiracy that was over social media, Facebook group. We got a lot of attention for that. And in that area, we had done cases against a member of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. We had done some coaches, some scoutmasters and everything. And I said, the only person getting away with this abuse of children is the Catholic Church. Hmm. And I'm not going to stand slow for this. Hmm. But in 2013, we did a fairly celebrated case against a priest who had at one time been at the parish that I grew up in. And he went to jail for eight years. And then we, we started to build another case up in Somerset, Johnstown area that was fairly significant. I think it really captures the whole story. The priest up there had been caught and released, which is, to me, the sin of the Catholic leadership. Mm -hmm. In 2009, the year before I had been U.S. attorney, he was suspected of raising money locally and then taking the money and exploiting children in Central America under, under the guise of... Hmm of ministry or missionary work, raising millions of dollars. So the investigation revived itself, and we started to bring it. And the case was percolating through its system. He was ultimately convicted, mm -hmm. and the appeal was affirmed by the Third Circuit. And it, it would surprise you and your listeners that there have been very few cases where that has happened. Even the case against Monsignor Lynn in Philadelphia was reversed. and. The Catholic Church has employed a strategy of either denying this or if someone is caught, they make a big to-do and that person leaves the scene. And then the Catholic Church has acted like a victim itself, contending that if they can prove that there's one person who is falsely charged, that that outweighs all of the victims on the other side. And, and I just have never bought that. Right. They have decided to protect the brand of the Catholic Church, 
by engaging in a comprehensive scheme of denying all this. So the bishops got together in 2002, and they went to Dallas. And you can pull this up and listen to it if you or read about it if you're curious. And they did a, a meeting, and they said, this will never happen again. And they established that it was time to cleanse the church of this ill. They'd gone back for 50 years. We relived the crime of sexual abuse, but we also relived with them another crime. The crime was robbery, the robbery of their childhood and innocence. Well, Craig and Paula and Michael and David and all the victim survivors, we cannot restore your innocent childhoods that were robbed from you, but we can prevent the robbery of other children's childhoods. That is what we pledge to do. And it continued to happen. Because I am a Catholic and I had worn it on my sleeve, most of the national press reached out to me and said, we'd like you to tell the story of what it's like to make a decision to fulfill your secular oath that might be challenging to your faith. Yeah. I took an oath to God that I was going to do the right thing. That does not allow me under my faith to violate that oath. Right. So all the major networks and news outlets were interested in this story yeah. because the fact is I had put away one priest for eight years another for 17, trial and appeal, right? and that had not really happened. So I kind of picked the person I was going to let do the story. It was a really good reporter I respected, Kevin Johnson, who had covered the China case against the PLA. He was the beat lawyer for the DOJ. Well, he did his work, and he exposed in his work and his questions to me that when I was a young child at St. Anne's School, we had a pedophile as a basketball coach. Hmm. Now, as best as I can remember, as sure as I am sitting here today, he never got me, but he got many members of my team. Hmm. It was so bad that we were 11 and 12 years old. We'd start crying when the clock got to four minutes in the fourth quarter because when the game was over, we were going to go into the locker room. We'd go to the right where our bench was. He would go to the left where he would be hidden behind a wall, and he would announce which child was to come back to get the review of how they played. And usually that child would be in tears, come back to the locker area where we were dressing, naked from the waist down, and then he would leave. Now, my dad, as I said in that reading we did earlier, was born in a rectory. And my dad, when I was an altar boy and playing basketball, would cross-examine me like the U.S. attorney. How long were you alone with the priest? And right. he, he was unusually conscious of this. So it was always my suspicion that he was a, a victim when he was a child. Huh. He would be a nuisance in my grade school basketball, God rest his soul. But he would be at every practice. He would be at every game. I remember one game when he couldn't be there, and it was a snowy day in February, and I ran off the court in my uniform. We used to wear really short shorts at that point, and my mom was outside, and she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm not going in that locker room. I remember it vividly. She, she you know, chastised me mm. that I was going to get a cold because I ran out in the snow in my sweaty uniform with no coat. And, and I had never talked about it. Right. We all knew about it. We have reunions at St. Anne's. We have a moment of silence for the people there. When we go back to the locker room, we all, it was just that thing everybody knew. Wow. Well, it was in the grand jury report that Josh Shapiro was able to get out of the Catholic Church at page 1300. The grand jury investigated six dioceses, Allentown, Harrisburg, Pittsburgh, Greensburg, Erie, and Scranton. Dozens of witnesses testified before the grand jury, detailing acts of sexual abuse by priests and how senior church officials covered up their criminal conduct, prioritizing their institution over the safety and welfare of these young boys and girls. The abuse scarred every diocese. The cover-up was sophisticated. And all the while, church leadership kept records of the abuse and the cover-up. And so Kevin Johnson's interviewing me. He said, did you ever play for David Giles? So at that moment, you might imagine I have in the back of my head, do I really want to go into this? Right. And it was in for a dollar, in for, in for it all. And I told that story, and it became the cover of USA Today last November. Right. 
they came back with a film crew and it became a video. And that's the story you're telling that I told. I, I just have to say it took courage to do that. You also got a lot of blowback, though. Oh, big time. People called you a traitor, as right. I understand it. You were attacked. Right. At the time, one of the pivotal questions was, how do you retain your faith? Yeah. And I said, I, I don't, I'm not going to let the bad people take my faith away from me. In fact, the nuns were more important to me than the priests, if you want to know the truth. And Sister Marlene Luffy, who taught me in first grade, second grade, fifth grade, eighth grade, was mm. my French teacher and principal, I still talk to her almost once a month. Right. Uh, I take her to lunch when I can. She's a family member to me. But my faith is my faith. It's independent of the decision makers and the leaders at the church. I go to church on my own terms now. I light a candle. I did have people coming up to me in the congregation through a misimpression that what I was doing was hostile to the mm. church. And I was trying to save the church. Right. But people would say, well, you know, they're, they're all in with the – this is a, an attack on the church. That's, that's bunk. Right. The church has brought this on itself. I heard a number the other day that there were 700,000 Catholics who regularly went to church in western Pennsylvania. It's now down to 200,000. The church has lost its moral high ground. Mm -hmm. I decided it was time. I don't know if, honestly, if I didn't have the choice. I don't know if I was U.S. attorney where I had the public responsibility whether I would have taken that on if I was still in the job. That would have been a tougher call. I'd like right. to think I would have. Um, but I didn't have that choice because it didn't materialize then. <clears throat> when the clock ran out on me by virtue of the 2016 election, I was headed to investigating all of the dioceses in my district, and then I wanted to investigate the Catholic conferences of the bishop. And I wanted them to answer this question. If you said what you said in 2002 in Dallas, how do you justify what's going on today? Because chapter and verse, it's been shown that they are still engaged in a cover-up. A question you wanted to investigate but couldn't, have you ever gotten an answer? No. You know, it's funny, again, along generational lines, mm. and the people my age look at me a little askance and they wonder. I think I have enough. They wish you'd just leave it alone. Yeah, and I think people have disagreed with me all my life. But honestly, I don't really believe people have ever discredited my motives or my integrity. Right. You know, I got very positive editorials when I left the U.S. Attorney's Office from the most far-right publications because they trusted that I was trying to do the right thing. I think the same is true in the Catholic Church. So I think people look at me and they say, you know, what are you doing? How does this help us? But I just, I'm not interested in being part of the conspiracy. Right, right. What's really interesting is the number of young people, including children of very prominent Catholics in Western Pennsylvania, who have gone out of their way to come to me and tell me how much they appreciate what I did. This is a big issue right. between our generation and the next generation. I'm very bullish on millennials generally. I think they don't really occupy the conventional placement on the political spectrum. I think they are sort of all over the place. I, but I I'd think agree with that. The yeah. unifying theme of these people is that they have zero tolerance for nonsense. Right. And this is certifiable grade A nonsense what the Catholic Church is doing. And they're either going to fix it or they're going to be gone. <laughs> certainly feels that way. How has your family's immigration heritage helped to change your views or shape your views about immigration policy? In a large way, if it is, and it should be true of almost all of us, we are all descendants. Mm -hmm. We're still a relatively young country. We are all descendants in some way or another right, of right. immigrants. And yet a lot of Right now, in the broken narrative that we have about immigration in our country, it's not unusual to see somebody who may himself or herself be the son or grandson of immigrants riding around with a bumper sticker that says, we're full up. There's many people who deserve a share of the blame for how we've got to where we are on mm -hmm. immigration. And the root of my desire to become active in this area is I was on the receiving end of criticism from both sides of the political spectrum when I was U.S. attorney. Mm. The people who you describe who drive around and either think we're full up in good faith or they're using anti-immigration sentiment as a proxy for just plain bigotry. Right. <laughs> the people who might feel legitimately that we have a broken system and they're not bigots. The, the people who 
oppose forward-leaning access to our country. Mm. They were very upset with me and felt I was violating my oath and not bringing more cases. Mm. At the same time, the Catholic nuns, <laughs> the Casa San Jose, the immigration group that's so active here, and the United Steelworkers of America, which had a close relationship with, they were a victim in the China case, were beating me mercilessly in the media. They wanted me to stop immigration enforcement entirely. Hmm. And so what I had forged was a mid-course of prioritizing what I consider to be only serious immigration cases, which was someone who's creating a violent crime or was a direct danger to our community, or someone who had gone through the process three or four times and had gone from administrative detention to misdemeanor violation to felony violation and came back. So a four-strike, you're out policy. I directed my team, bring me those cases, and until Congress gets out of their own way and solves this, which was going at the time, you know, 2013 was a pivotal year where Congress really lost the chance to solve this, that I wasn't going to what I termed overheat immigration. This did not prove to be any um, protection for me from criticism because there were two cases. Uh, one, Mr. Ramos up in Cleveland, who was picked up in a shopping mall in Cleveland, and uh, somehow they brought him to Erie, Pennsylvania to intake him. He had been accused of failing to yield in a shopping mall parking lot. Now, Grant, you and I have been driving about the same time. Have you ever seen anyone yield in a shopping no. parking lot? So no. you can conclude he was targeted. Right. And I concluded he was targeted. He had been married, but he was divorced. He had three children who were born here. He worked every day. He paid taxes, and he had no criminal record. Mm -hmm. He was administratively detained longer than if he had been convicted for the crime. So I made a decision to charge him, but then I was going to release him because I wanted to get him out of administrative detention. You talk about an injustice. Here's a guy being held against his will, having been picked up in Cleveland. He doesn't even belong in western Pennsylvania. Right. Away from his kids. Away from his kids. I show up in Washington, D.C., and there's a demonstration against me. Hmm. I'm being called the Sheriff Joe Arpaio of immigration. Oh, my. Well, then later in my tenure, almost to the end, there was a case here in Pittsburgh of Miguel Esquivel Hernandez, who was living in the South Hills. He had repeatedly come back after he had been removed. He had been the four strikes, you're out type person. And he had the bad idea of getting in a car that he did not own without a license, putting a license plate that did not belong on that car. The car had no insurance, mm. and then getting arrested for speeding. And the pro-immigration community decided that I should let him go. And I engaged in a lot of outreach with him, and I said, I took an oath. He's now subject to process, and I intend to fulfill my oath, and I am going to charge him. And there was a huge brouhaha about that. You know, all the human interest stories about his family. And the feeling was that he was targeted, that he had been picked up for speeding on the day after he had participated in an immigration rally in Beachview. I never was completely comfortable that he wasn't targeted. But the long story short was I could not account for where he had gotten from here to there. Right. And I had a job to do. Right. So I was really getting whacked from both sides. You brought the same sense of justice to the work of immigration. You spoke at a 2020 World Affairs Council event where you were asked about the need for different policy on immigration. You spoke about what you called Immigration Policy 2.0. You said, we need to fundamentally reestablish the value of our diverse culture and reassert the currency of differences which we owe to our immigrant past. It was a wonderful day in December, December 12th, where I gave that speech. It was a great audience. It was a speech I'm very proud of, but my purpose in putting that speech together was to identify how we got from here to there. Yeah. And in my view, the Democrats have made mistakes, the Republicans have made mistakes, community activists have made mistakes, and the big loser is good old Uncle Sam the United States of America. Because here's what's happened just since I've given that speech. I tried to make the point at the end that no matter where you are on immigration, the phenomenon known as a population bomb, whereby the country begins to lose its workforce because of negative birth rate, right. such that like any business, if you have 
more pensioners than you have workers, you're financially upside down. Right. That happened in Greece. That happened in Italy. And I told the story in December. It's now happening here. Hmm. And five other countries have identified this phenomenon. For some reason, millennials are getting married later. They're having less children. And we have more people dying than are being born. Right. Right. That is unsustainable. It's disastrous. I predict that at some point in the reasonably foreseeable future, maybe in our lifetimes, we're actually going to be having carnivals and fairs to attract immigrants to this country because we're going to be competing with the rest of the world right. to try and recruit immigrants. And right now, if you said something like that in certain parts of western Pennsylvania, you better be in a fast car right. <laughs> to Very get fast out of car. town. Right, right. But we are allowing ourselves to be the agents of our own destruction. And it's probably, again, another example of where our inability to have civil discourse and debate respectfully, to disagree without being disagreeable, to be able to apply friction right. to yield reason is, is holding us back. I mean, that could be the subject of a whole podcast on its own. So thank, you, to for, do it. <laughs> thank you for that, that answer. Is there a path forward? Are you hopeful that we can get past the present environment? It's complicated, but if I were to oversimplify it, if every American had the opportunity I had to sit in a naturalization ceremony as the U.S. attorney where I would supervise the taking of the oath of new citizens right. in this country, they would not be for immigration bans. Right. It is one of the most beautiful things I did as U.S. attorney. I literally cried every time I watched it. Wow. Because yeah. all you could think about is the courage and the bravery of these people who are doing something that so goes beyond getting out of your comfort zone, it doesn't right. even do it justice. Right. Imagine coming to a country that you don't even know the language. Right. And that you're willing, what you would do exceeds what incumbent Americans would do to succeed. It is what made our country great. But, you know, you have to get people in, in a bar with a beer <laughs> yeah. to be able to say to them, the whole idea that it hurts the American worker has been debunked by right. every valid economist. Right. It actually helps the American worker. David, the name of our podcast is We Can Be. Mm -hmm. What do you think we as a country or as a community can be? The answer to both is we can be whatever we want to be and we can be the best. Our country depends upon an active citizenry and that everybody sees themselves as a public servant. Mm. And we live it when we pay our taxes. We live it when we do jury duty. We live it when we vote. You don't have to hold office to be a public servant in this country, but you have to be faithful to the mission. Mm. It is as corrupt as the people who are doing bad things to give up. Right. So I hope people don't give up. Terrific. David, thank you so much. This has been a joy. Thank you. Yeah. Always great to talk to you. Throughout his storied career, David Hickton has kept true to a guiding belief about his own identity. He told me, when I get up in the morning, I still think of myself as a civil rights advocate. It is with that guiding tenet that David has changed the lives of countless Americans, from the abused and those suffering from mental illness, to victims of cybercrime, to the underserved whose chance to succeed is held back by algorithms that unfairly count them out of the game. David also said that he approaches his work by, quote, doing his homework and reasoning his way to a conclusion. I would say that for David, another key part of why he has helped bring justice to so many is his combination of empathy and an unwavering belief that justice is possible and worth pursuing no matter the odds. Let's join him as civil rights advocates who do our homework and reason ourselves to the conclusion that all of us, every single one, deserve to live in a just world. Mm -hmm.